Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Logan Yuri to discuss how to not die alone, the surprising science that will help you find love, a funny and practical guide to help you find, build, and keep the relationship of your dreams, published by our friends at Simon & Schuster. Logan Yuri is an internationally recognized expert on modern love. As the Director of Relationship Science at the dating app Hinge, Logan leads a research team dedicated to helping people find love. After studying psychology at Harvard, she ran Google's behavioral science team, The Irrational Lab, and created the popular interview series, Talks at Google, Modern Romance. She's a 2018 TED resident. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Ellen Hewitt. Ellen is a reporter covering startups for Bloomberg News and Bloomberg Businessweek magazine. She was also the host of the first season of Foundering, a narrative podcast focused on the high stakes drama of Silicon Valley. She also worked as a staff writer at Forbes and a crime reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of How to Not Die Alone from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi, Logan. Hi, thanks for having me. And hi to my family who's in South Florida and watching along at home. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Um, great, this is so exciting. We get to start. Yay, um, Yay let's um, do it. Yeah, for, for those of you um, watching at home, you know, um, obviously I'm here to interview Logan as the author of this awesome new book, but we're also really good friends. And so I, I wanted to um, just congratulate her on something so exciting, which is the publication of this book, which I have watched you work on for the last, I don't know, like three years, like you must feel great. And so I'm really happy for you. And I also wanted to start by asking about the original inspiration for writing this book. Like what was the, tell us about like the first moment you were like, I think I'm gonna embark on this crazy journey. Yes, well, Ellen, first of all, thank you for saying yes, and thank you for doing this. And I'll reveal to our viewers that we are very close friends. Ellen helped me with several parts of the book. I would text her in the middle of the night and say, does the word follow up have a dash in it? And I, I love asking Ellen grammar questions. And maybe the most, most important question I've ever asked you is, will you officiate my wedding? And yeah. so I just hope that everyone's watching understands, you know, we're excited to hang out with you for an hour, but we're also excited to hang out with each other for an hour. And I'm, I'm, I was maybe most excited for this event out of all of them because you've just been part of this journey, and I think it'll be really fun to talk about it and connect the dots and and all of that. So thanks for doing this. Of course. Yeah. Okay. I should answer your question, which yeah. is, how did this book come to be? So I was reflecting on this, and six years ago, I went to a co-working space in San Francisco. And I opened up a Google Doc and I wrote in the title, Behavioral Science Plus Dating. And now six years later, the book has just come out. And so this has really been an idea for a long time. And it's been amazing to see the journey and to actually take the leap and leave my job and pursue this world of dating full time. But for people who aren't familiar with my story, I have two big interests, psychology and the science of decision making, and then dating and relationships. And I've been spending the last six years figuring out how to marry the two. And so some of this has taken the form of dating coaching. I work with people one on one to help them overcome their dating blind spots. Some of this came in my residency at TED, where I was doing a lot of research and things like breakups. And now it's taken the form of the book and my research at Hinge, where I focus all about breaking down relationships into individual decisions and then helping people make better decisions along the way. Yeah, I, and I love that because so much of how we think about behavioral science today also has to do with applications in like in apps of, of, of all kinds and the idea that you get to then influence Hinge, which I know from, you know, my among my friends is like a very popular and um, beloved dating app, even if sometimes the activities that happen on or off of it can be um, emotionally heavy. Um, okay, so then let's start by talking about the book. So, you know, what I love about it is it's so 
practical. It's like this really wonderful guide about all the different stages of love from the very beginning when you're like, I'm single and I, I don't even feel ready to start dating <laughs> yeah. to the end where you talk about like, what does marriage satisfaction feel like 20 or 30 years down the road? I, I just think it's this wonderful span of all the different kinds of experiences that love um, takes place. And so I, I think one of the easiest ways in, and, and I know you've talked a lot about this before, is the three dating tendencies because mm -hmm. it's just like a really simple, where do you fit along this spectrum? And I think even for people who are not actively dating, I, and, and I'll share a little bit about this later, but like, I think it brings up interesting ways of thinking about how you approach the world um, and like what ideas you have about what's true about it. So maybe you can explain a little bit about what the three dating tendencies are and then we can like talk about them. Yeah, absolutely. And so the organization of the book is it's broken into thirds. And the first third is getting ready. And it's understanding why are you single? Why haven't things been working out for you? What's the information that I need to arm you with so that you can go out there and start dating? The second third is getting out there. And it's about going on dates, using dating apps, understanding how to meet people IRL in real life and understanding why you should go on the second date. And the last third is getting serious. And so it's the stuff you talked about. It's, should we move in together? Should we define the relationship? Should we break up? Should we get married? And so I really wanted to write this A to Z journey. I wanted it to be a book that lives on your shelf that you come back to over and over again. And you know, the book has only been out for about 10 days, but I'm starting <laughs> to hear from people about well, I'm at this stage, but I read the whole book, but I bet I'll reread the getting married stage later. And so, yeah, I was just really wanted to write this guide and take people through the journey. In terms of the three dating tendencies, what happened there was I have dating coaching clients who are very different, all different types of identities, orientations, backgrounds, job, class, education, et cetera. But I noticed that they seem to suffer from the same issues and they seem to have the same dating blind spots, these patterns of behaviors, these ways of thinking that led them astray and that held them back from finding love. And so I've categorized these three tendencies um, into this framework called the three dating tendencies. And basically how it works is that each one suffers from unrealistic expectations. And the first one is the romanticizer and they have unrealistic expectations of relationships. And they think that love is going to be Prince Charming and he will come find you and you don't have to put effort in. And if you put effort in, it's unromantic. And they're all about um, the meet cute and the way that love happens. And they have this idea that they'll find their soulmate, this one person who's for them. And if it feels like effort, then they're doing it wrong because when they find the right person, it will be effortless. The second type is the maximizer. And I have to say, this is the majority of my clients, at least in the Bay Area where we live. These are the people who have unrealistic expectations of their partner. And so this sounds ridiculous, but I have real coaching clients that say, could I be 5% happier with somebody else? Could I find a girlfriend who's 5% hotter, 5% funnier, 5% more ambitious? And they really are that grass is greener person. They feel like their partner is such an important decision and they need to research their way to the right answer. They need to be 100% certain about who they're gonna commit to. And they're always swiping for the next best person as opposed to investing in a relationship and making it great. They wanna find the perfect person. The last person, the last tendency is the hesitator and they have unrealistic expectations of themselves. And this is the person who says, I'll be ready to date when I lose 10 pounds when I have a more impressive job title, when I move and have a better house. And they feel like love is something that happens to you when you deserve it. And so it's sort of a self-confidence thing. But the thing about the hesitator is that they don't understand. You get better at dating by dating. Dating is a skill. And also, how are you gonna figure out who you wanna be with if you're not going out there on dates? And so really for the hesitator, it's about overcoming some of those self-love, self-confidence things, and just putting themselves out there and starting to date. Yeah, and it's so fascinating because I hadn't thought of this, like these separations of these three categories before I read, I think like probably early drafts of your book or heard you talk about it. And yeah. I have so many friends who are hesitators and it's just this hard thing to watch because it's like, they're amazing people and I want them to get out there and be meeting people. And it's especially hard, I think during COVID and we'll come back to that later. But um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating how, you know, it's obviously a bit of confirmation bias, but like once I saw you, define this particular archetype. I had I had thought of the other ones before, but this one I was like, it's just so common. And I wonder if it's 
um, I don't know, like, is it more common among people who, who just kind of like have high standards for themselves or what's usually driving it? Yeah, so there's oftentimes combinations, right? So a lot of people are romanticizers and they're hesitators. And so the reason that they're hesitating is because they have these unrealistic expectations of relationships. And so they can be combined. And for anyone who's watching who's interested, you can take the quiz on my website and figure out what you are. But I would say among the people who seek out my help, there are a lot of maximizers because who is gonna say, I am going to pay for this luxury service of dating coaching and I am going to kind of make a plan and execute on it. That's a maximizer. They like research, they like having a plan. I don't even see hesitators a lot of the time because they're not even putting themselves out there to work with me. But the thing about hesitators or, or what I wanna say is that the pandemic really has exacerbated the hesitator tendency because how easy was it last March to say, oh, I'll just start dating again when this whole thing is over. And now we're almost at a year and they haven't made any progress. And the truth is you don't have to take this year off from dating. There's a lot of creative and resilient ways that people are still meeting. And so I think that this moment is anxiety provoking. I think it leads to a lot of insecurities and it is really hard for hesitators to overcome that tendency during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, as a as a maximizer myself, I feel like e like e even though I'm in a relationship and so I'm, I'm not thinking about these questions in the same way, I did also notice, um, you know, you lay out in the book this difference between having a maximizing tendency and like a sort of satisfying or or just feeling like when you find something that's good enough, that's okay, as opposed to always searching for the same thing. And I, you know, even though I'm not thinking about dating, I feel like I noticed that in myself mm -hmm. in like different things that I look for. Like I realized. I'm totally a maximizer when it comes to like shopping online for like the the right item. Like I feel like I have to look through every option before I feel okay about buying the same thing, but I don't feel the same way at all when it comes to picking a restaurant to eat at. It's like, I don't care. I mean, if it seems good enough, I'll be excited about it. And so it was like fascinating to see, you know, obviously I think people are going to read your book because of its application to dating, but the lessons are are applicable like way outside of that. Um, and then last question about these three tendencies. The other thing that I love about the romanticizer is just how it allows you to reflect on the norms and sort of lessons that we pick up about love from the stuff we watch. And I'm wondering, like, obviously I know Disney, Disney movies are sort of the ultimate culprit of this, this idea that like love sweeps you away in a flurry of like singing birds and like princess ribbons. And, and it's just, it's obviously not like that. And a lot of rom-coms do the same thing, but I'm wondering if you're seeing at all any changes like in the last five years about representations of love in TV and movies. Like, do you think there's any hope that they'll ever represent something a little bit more realistic or is it, or will your advice still be that you should avoid taking love lessons from, from the movie theater? Yeah. Okay. So first I want to respond to the maximizer satisfies your thing, just because it is one of the most useful frameworks in the book. And I want people to hear about it. And when people ask me like, how have you changed your own behavior after writing this book? This is probably the number one thing. And so there's this concept called maximizer and satisficer. It comes from the sociologist, Herbert Simon. The idea is that imagine that you're on a plane, remember airplanes, and you are searching for a movie to watch one type of person goes through every single possible movie on the plane and then only when they've seen the complete set of movies they say okay the correct movie is hustlers because i heard it was very good and i didn't get to see it the other person scrolls a little bit and says oh good Will hunting that's a good movie i haven't seen that in a while that's entertaining and they start watching it and so the first type is a maximizer they want to see the complete set and only when they've seen every possible example can they choose the perfect one, the objective right choice. The satisficer says, I have expectations and they can be very high expectations, but I will make that selection when I have satisfied those expectations. And so the maximizer is obsessed with the objective right answer, but the satisficer is the one who often feels better about their decision because they say, I'm gonna watch Good Will Hunting, I'm gonna enjoy it, and they do. And the maximizer gets halfway through Hustlers and then says, oh, the plane is landing because I spent the whole time researching the movies. And so 
what I say in the book is that life is about how you feel about your decisions, not making the best decision. And you can't date everyone. So there's no, there's no turning over every leaf. And so I have really tried in my life to move from being a maximizer to a satisficer. And last summer, my husband and I bought a car and we got our insurance and bought the car in 48 hours. And that is extremely crazy for a maximizer because normally I would have spent months researching on Reddit and every review site, but we just said, we want a used hybrid that we like driving. We drove a few. We got a used 2018 Toyota Camry and we're really happy with it. And I think satisficing has made me happier. And so just wanted to emphasize that point that life isn't about the objective right decision. It's about having high expectations, finding something that satisfies those and then and then being happy with your choice. Um, and now I have forgotten your question because oh, I Oh, romanticizers. To Do you think movies are oh, yeah. going to change? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So what I say in the book is that we have this concept of romanticism. And this is an idea that started in around 1750. And it was originally something that poets and philosophers would talk about. And it was that marriage all of a sudden became about love and soulmates and passion. And there was these expectations. There's one person out there for you. And this idea has now percolated all of our culture. And when we think about love, we think about romanticism. But in the span of human history, these concepts are very new. The idea of marrying for love would once have seemed ridiculous. Marriage was an institution of convenience. It was for economic reasons. My father would give Ellen's father 12 camels for my hand in marriage, right? And the, you know, love was this magical spark that you maybe felt once or twice in your life, but likely outside of marriage. And so the first point is just that, it's, it's a new experience to have these very sky high expectations of romance in your marriage. And that's just one thing to know. It's not that this has always been this way. And yes, in the book, I talk about the fact that romantic comedies and Disney movies, they perpetuate the happily ever after fallacy, the idea that the hard work of love is finding someone. And we just know that that's not true. That's hard, but the hard work continues. It's hard to invest <laughs> in your relationship. It's, it's hard to keep it alive. But you know, you were asking in the last five years, have I seen a difference? Well, I, I think this is like kind of braggy, but I was on this panel today with this woman from Bridgerton. Have you seen Bridgerton? I've seen some clips. Okay. You've yeah. seen, I know I know that you don't watch that much TV, but <laughs> I, I binge watched it over the last month. I loved it. It's like the new hot show on Netflix and it is very traditional, right? It's like people going to balls and falling in love. And I was like, you know, my book kind of hates on these rom-coms, but there is a time and a place for them. And I enjoyed it so much. And so I think it's fine to indulge and have a fairy tale and enjoy a love story. I just wouldn't make decisions based on the information in a show like Bridgerton. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. And, and it's, and it's funny how they are, they are enjoyable and like, and, and yet I think in many ways they've probably caused people so much pain over the years that, that they would feel like, oh, my relationship isn't stacking up to what I have been taught that it should. Um, I mean, yeah, I think thinking about those kinds of lessons really makes me feel like what you're doing is, is like going to help people just like be happier and have better relationships, which I just love. Um, oh, thanks, Alan. Yeah. And then I think another thing that I love about your book that's sort of, I imagine maybe a, a larger theme about maybe like behavioral science and sort of like decision making overall is that contrary to what people might think about romance and their love life, you actually are asserting that you have a lot of control over the outcome mm -hmm. of your of your romantic life. I know a lot of people who think about their love lives and they're sort of like, well, I've just been unlucky or like mm -hmm. it's so hard and like, People who are finding the right partner, like they must have just stumbled upon something good. Um, and and I actually I'm wondering how much of what you've been working on is like inspired by the idea that you can tell people that they have more agency than you think. Like I, it's it's kind of a more of a profound question, but it's it came up when you were talking about this idea of like yeah, it's not what decision you make because like you could make the wrong decision. It's actually about like something you can control better, which is how do I feel about the decision that I've made? How can I tell myself to think about something in a different frame of mind that allows me to have more control over like kind of the happiness outcomes of my life was that was that like a big part of your thinking 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're making a profound point, which is do people feel empowered when you simply tell them you are empowered and this is up to you? And I, I think that we could debate that back and forth. And there's probably research that shows both things because if you tell people that, but then they, they actually aren't in control, then it could be very frustrating. But I think it started from a more humble place, which is that I've been doing dating coaching one-on-one. I sit down with people and they say to me, why haven't I found love? Why has this worked out for everyone, but not for me? And they have a story in their head that they're unlovable, that because their parents got divorced, there's something wrong with them, that if they had not broken up with that college boyfriend who's now married, then their life would be different, right? And they have all these narratives around how it just hasn't worked out for them and there's something wrong with them. And I feel like what I was able to do in a way that impacted their lives was to say, you have some patterns of behavior that are leading you astray and you're repeating them over and over. You are 34 years old and you wanna have kids in a few years, but you keep dating these guys that don't take themselves seriously. The guy you just described to me lives in a basement without any windows. And there's nothing wrong with that, but is that the person who's most likely to be ready to have kids with you in a few years? No, and so your issue is that you are not being picky enough and you're not taking yourself seriously enough. And then I help them. And the next time that they're attracted to a guy like that for some reasons that, you know, psychological reasons and other things, don't go in that direction, make a different choice. And so often Ellen, people are like, I have a type. And then they call me and they're like, Logan, I'm dating this guy, but he's not my type. And in my head, I'm like, this is the one that's going to work out because your so-called type was bad for you. Yeah. And so what I want to do is empower people and say, you can find a great relationship by making a series of good decisions along the way. And that's how you're gonna propel yourself into this thing. I'm not saying it's easy. Behavior change is really hard, but I'm saying it's possible because you are not cursed. You're not too old. You're not too anything. It's much more about approaching dating with a strategic and optimistic mindset. And so, I get a lot of criticism, right? Like you're trying to make us all rational and love is this organic thing. And what I say to that is no, I'm trying to help us understand that we're irrational and how can we try to overcome that a bit? And while love is this natural instinct, dating isn't. Dating is a pretty new thing and it's 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 not unrealistic to be strategic about it. Yeah. And do you do you have your clients push back against you when you try to talk about like you know, I know you have a whole section in there about like, fuck the spark and these things that people feel in their gut where they're like, oh, but like, I want to feel the spark towards someone that I'm going to continue dating. Like, I want to feel this kind of crazy in love sense or, or, or and, and like, when they push back to you, what do you say? Yeah. So in the book, in the chapter on the romanticizer, I talk about the story of Maya and I can just see this image in my head so clearly where she's on my couch and she's saying, she's crying and she's saying, you want me to give up on my idea of love and you want me to settle and everybody else gets the epic love story and I don't. And she just felt so denied. And she felt like I was saying to her, settle and give up on expectations. And that's not what I was saying. What I was saying is that her perceptions of love were misinformed. She would get dressed up for a flight hoping to meet someone, but then wouldn't put any effort into talking to someone because she thought effort was unromantic. And so I was trying to help break the bad habits without making her feel like she was losing some sort of battle. And so what happened with Maya was that she kept her expectations high, but she focused on the right thing. She focused on kindness, loyalty, how this person made her feel. And she wound up with someone really great. And so it wasn't about settling. It was about being mature, giving up on things that don't matter, and actually paying attention to the things that do. Yeah. And you talked about um, making people realize just how irrational humans are. And then that's obviously yeah. like an underpinning of the whole book. I mean, one of the things that I love that I think people might get a glimpse of if they read the book, but um, they would know better if they knew you in person is that, um, you know, Scott <laughs> appears as a character, you know, from time to time and he's in the book. Um, and I think he comes up across great. But what's funny is if you see Scott and Logan in person, like they're just very different people, like very different yeah. in terms of what they like to do for fun, what sort of, you know, whether they like to be at the center of attention or like watching on the sidelines or like their their attitudes around um, just sort of like living life. And, and I love you both for different reasons. Um, but that's what made this part of the book that really stuck out to me where you were like, oh, I, you know, I swiped left on Scott years before you guys actually started dating. And so I thought, 
you know, let's talk a little bit about why you were wrong about what you wanted. Like, why did you think your now husband was not a good fit for you? And like, why should you have maybe thought something different? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to answer that question. And I'll also say, you know, you and I are talking about 10 days after my book has come out. And so it's been interesting to see once it's out in the world, excuse me, once it's out in the world, what are the things that people are responding to? And one of them is really this part about swiping left on Scott. And I've been trying to think about why. And I think it's that people are like, oh, I'm making these like micro decisions on these apps and I might be doing a bad job at it. And I think that it's leading to what I hope people will understand, which is you think you know what you want, but you're wrong. You think that you're so sure about what you should and should not swipe on, but you could very mu much likely be wrong. And so let me give the short history of Scott. So he and I met in college. We had lunch once. We know this because he then wrote on my Facebook wall. Seven years later, I saw him on Tinder and I said, ah, it kind of looks like a bro. Didn't think about it very much and swiped left. We met again at Google. I mentioned at this lunch that I was trying to learn this coding language R. He said, I just dropped out of a math PhD in that language. Um, we just were friends and I was a little interested in him, but he said two things that turned me off. He said, I don't like people who go to Burning Man <laughs> and I'm not interested in international travel. And I said, oh, not the person for me. And so I didn't pursue anything. And then a year later through a series of self work that I did, I realized how much I liked him and I, started spending more time with him at work. And eventually I said, I'm free on Friday night. Why don't you ask me out? And now six years later, we're married. And so why I think people are responding to that story is because it just shows that the apps are a two dimensional representation of people. And they just show, you know, Scott probably spent 30 seconds picking a couple pictures <laughs> from a hiking trip he had gone on. And I don't think he was like, well, am I a bro? Do I seem like a bro? Do I want to be a bro? He was just like, here are the six most recent photos. Let me upload them quickly as possible to see my matches. And so we spend all this time thinking that we really know what we want and that we're so good at differentiating the good profiles from the bad profiles. And I hope the lesson there, there's a few. One is be open-minded about your type. Two, get to the date as quickly as possible because you just don't know what somebody's profile is like. And three, the person who you end up dating who makes you happiest long-term might be someone you already know. And I should, I should end by saying, Scott and I have been to Burning Man together twice, <laughs> as Ellen knows. Um, we have done lots of international travel. And so these reasons that I had brushed him off for it, they weren't even real. They were just things that he had said that were actually changeable. And so I think that we are making these really dramatic decisions, thinking that we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we just don't know what we're talking about. And so we should be humble and we should date like a scientist and see what actually happens for us. Yeah. And and it's funny because in many ways I think seeing you two I see how complimentary you are but it, but it is like I think you are too I think you two are a great example of like a relationship of opposites and probably highlighting you know another thing that you talked about in the book which is like it's not actually that important that you guys share hobbies or or like sort of the surface level ways that you want to spend time. Um, okay, I'm going to move to some questions. Um, that, uh, so there are, obviously there's a way to submit questions. If you're interested, please feel free um, and um, I'll pull from some of these. So here's one, um, I, do, I do love this question so I'd like to hear your answer from Kevin. How did you decide on the book title? I think it's catchy and it made me sign up for the book talk. It's obviously provocative. I think I've like, I've shown a copy of your book to some of my housemates and they're like, ooh, oh, how to not die alone. Um, <laughs> tell me about the decision and do, were you ever worried that it was gonna not be what you wanted? Yeah, thank you, Kevin, for the question. Yes, yeah, so I was very precious about my book cover and my book title, and I, I cared a lot. I have a marketing hat that I can wear, and I, I just knew that this would be a big deal. And so my publisher, they were they wanted a title like, this is how you find love, and something that was straightforward and told you, this is hopeful, this is going to be benefit-driven. And I believe I was at a dinner, and Ellen, we can talk about this if you want to, um, where I was getting feedback on the book. And I think somebody said the phrase, how to not die alone. And I just wrote it down. And I loved it because I like how to, I like being practical. And I love the idea of how to not die alone. And obviously the frame of the book is behavioral science. One of the key tenets of behavioral science is that behavior change is really hard. And so my vision for the book is that somebody would be in the airport and they'd be looking at the airport bookshop and they would see this book title, How to Not Die Alone. And they would stop in their tracks and they would say, hmm, am I on a path towards dying alone? Am I headed in this direction? 
And then the point of the book is to actually jolt your system and have you ask yourself that question. And if you don't like the direction you're headed in, let me give you the tips and tricks to move you in a different course of direction. And so it's really trying to create this feeling of fear, right? In behavioral science, we talk about loss aversion and, 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 and fear of giving something up. And so it is supposed to create this emotional reaction. And people have been emailing me and saying, I find this triggering, dating is hard enough as it is. And I'm not coming from a lack of empathy. I'm saying you're making choices that are leading you somewhere. And if you want to make different ones, then you need to actually change direction. And so it is supposed to evoke some emotion and some fear. And hopefully that fear will make you make better choices. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny to think about, you talked about loss aversion, like obviously, um, I think once you start to see, and I've experienced this, I think being your friend and knowing other people who have studied behavioral science, it's like once you start to see these biases and you, like and cognitive tricks that you can use, it's it's like, you can apply them to everything, including, um, you know, selecting the title for your book. And also, this was reminding me um, that I know you used like outside accountability and other sort of behavioral tricks mm -hmm. to get the book done in the first place. Like you didn't let yourself have a birthday party until you had like, <laughs> like accomplished a certain milestone of the book, which I think is wonderful. So I'm making a strong pitch for people, even if they're not that interested in reading it for the dating stuff. I, I feel like behavioral science has kind of changed the way that I see the world. So anyway, um, here's another question that has gotten an upvote. Um, it says, it's from Ashley, it says, we've been seeing that dating trends have shifted with people being more intentional about dating rather than just frantically dating. How else do you think dating trends will be affected due to the pandemic? So I'd love to talk about like COVID dating and then also like what you think might last past the end, you know, after we're fingers crossed all vaccinated. Yeah. And so I'll just start by saying it's been really interesting to have this book come out during the pandemic to have worked at Hinge for the last year during the pandemic. And so I had finished the manuscript before I started working there. And I just gave the explanation for the title. It's supposed to jolt your system and lead to behavior change. And that's what's happened with the pandemic too. It's just been such a bizarre, chaotic time that people who were headed on one path have actually taken a step back and said, I'm alone. I'm sheltering in place by myself. I don't like this. I want to make different choices. I want to prioritize different things. And so I feel like the pandemic has had that same impact. And my book is about intentional love. The last line is live intentionally ever after. And it's been so interesting because intentionality, at least in my work at Hinge, has become the buzzword. People are being more introspective about who they are, what they want, and how they want to show up in relationships. We've seen that occur in a few ways. Ghosting is down 27%, which we see as a sign that people are being more careful about who they match with and more empathetic about how they communicate. 84% of Hinge users in a survey that we just ran say they want to be more selective about their matches in 2021. And so I really have seen this intentional dating take off, this idea that people are taking themselves more seriously and doing that inner work. I think the main trend that will continue is video dating. Video dating is something that nobody was doing before. If you FaceTimed, it was probably with a long-term partner who was long distance or traveling. And now almost half of Hinge users have tried a video date and it's become a very common low pressure vibe check, right? We say the video date is the new coffee date and the majority of Hinge users who have tried video dating say that they'll keep doing it even after the pandemic. So uh, the first trend was intentional dating. The second one, is video dating. And I think the third one, which we could see, is that when the pandemic is over and that people are able to meet up safely in person, that there's going to be this rise in relationships because people are going to say, finding someone is more important to me now. And, you know, God forbid there's another pandemic. I, I don't want to be by myself. And finding that partner has become that much more important to me. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, how does Hinge track whether ghosting is happening or not? Is it like surveys or like you're looking at? So this specifically yeah. was a survey where, I mean, we did a whole thing about ghosting where we were asking people, do you ghost? Have you been ghosted? Just tons of stuff about ghosting. And then it was a question of like, have you been ghosted more or less during the pandemic? And have you been ghosting more or less? And then, uh, following up with interviews and things like that. But we also do have a feature called your turn, where if two people are talking and one person drops off, we nudge you behavioral science to get back into the conversation. And we say it's your turn to continue it. And that has uh, also limited ghosting. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love love a good love a good nudge. Um, cool. Well, let's do another question. This one's from our mutual friend Connor. Hi, Connor. 
Um, he says, you talk a lot about how love is a toy. <coughs> Would love to hear more about this as it feels pretty counterintuitive. We're taught from a young age that love is based on so many externalities, e.g. the spark, outside our control. How much of who we love is actually a choice? And I know we've touched a little bit on this, but but I am actually curious, like on the edge of that question, like, yeah, what are things we can't control? I know we've talked a lot about what is within our, our ability to change, but what's not? Yeah, I love the question. It's very deep. I want to think about it more. The first thing that comes to mind is uh, this line from the sociologist and you know love philosopher Eric Fromm, who says, love is a verb. And I actually write, so Connor wrote, love is a choice. And I actually feel like I want to change that to love is a verb. Love is something that you actively do, something that you invest in. Love is 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 every single day choosing to invest and to show up and put the time in. People have really been responding to this chapter called Fuck the Spark. And the idea there is that I'm saying a lot of people go on first dates. They don't feel that automatic instant chemistry. And they say, I'm not going to give this another this other person a chance. And in the book, I bust three myths around the spark. The first one is that if you don't feel the spark, it won't grow. And we know that that's not true. Only 11% of people experience love at first sight. And lots of times, right? I know my I knew my husband for eight years before we started dating. Lots of time, the spark could grow. The second one is that if you feel the spark, it must be a good thing. That's just not true. Some people are very sparky. They make you feel attracted to them because they're charismatic or they're, you know, they're very hot and maybe they're just narcissistic. That's could be what's going on. You're confusing anxiety that you feel for chemistry. And the last myth is that if you feel the spark, then it must be a viable relationship. We just know that that's not true. A lot of divorced couples once felt the spark. And so I'm not saying that if you have no attraction, you should commit to that person and try to make a relationship. Instead, I'm saying you can build attraction with far more people than you think. Stop being distracted by the instant chemistry of the spark, which often fades, and instead go for the slow burn. Go for the person who becomes more charming over time, who's reliable, who would make a great long-term partner. And so the, the science of attraction is a different thing, but this is about decision-making. And this is saying, give more people a chance because you could create a great relationship with far more people than you think. And that it's really up to you what you invest to build a relationship versus just imagining that your soulmate is gonna find you and it's gonna be instant fireworks. Yeah. Um, we have another one from Drew. He says, um, do you find different generations approach dating differently? Are older generations more difficult or easier to change their behaviors? That's an interesting question. I should start off by humbly saying that I mostly work with millennials. I do interact with some Gen Z singles through my work at Hinge. And of course, I've had conversations with people who are older, but the majority of my Hinge work and my work as a dating coach is in millennials. So that's what I can speak to authoritatively. The next thing that I'll say is that the first chapter of my book is called Why Dating is Harder Now Than Ever Before. And the first sentence is about why dating is so hard and you can tell your mom I said that. <laughs> and it's really about the fact that Dating as we know it, the idea of two people coming together without a matchmaker, without your community, that's only been around since about 1890. So in the span of human history, this is very new. Online dating started in 1994. So this is very new. And dating apps only started 10 years ago. And so we are really navigating the beginning of a huge thing. And so if you find it hard, you're not the only one. We are just starting to figure this out. And so I think it's not about the generations of how do boomers date versus how do we date? It's how does dating in 2021 compare to dating 20 years ago? And I think it's genuinely very hard. There's so much choice. There's so many expectations put. You know, you have to have this marriage with, with passionate love your whole life and we expect to be self-actualized. And so I think it's really about expectations of modern dating versus the past, as opposed to how individual generations see it. And I think maybe I'll end by saying behavior change is hard for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what you touched on is another another one of these lessons that I think I probably first read about in your book, but I just think about it all the time, which is the paradox of choice. And this idea yeah. that like the more choices you have when trying to make a decision, the more cursed you are, like the, the less likely you are that you're going to feel happy with what you eventually picked, um, the more you're going to ruminate over like whether it was the right choice or not. Like, I feel like I see my friends struggle with this when it comes to um picking a job, like like the more options you have, like the, the tougher it feels, obviously when it comes to dating, but also small stuff just about like 
making a choice every day between like what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, like what you're going to do. Um, and as, as someone who also, yeah, like I both want, I know that I fall into this a lot because it's like, I want all these choices and yet I, I do struggle with feeling happy when I've picked something. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. Like, how does it apply to day? Yeah. Where does it yeah. come from? Why are we so screwed over? Yeah. In this way? I'm glad you brought that up because I think there's a couple lines that we can connect. And so one of them is that we think we know what will make us happy long term, but we're often wrong. And we're really bad at what's known as effect, but affective forecasting. And affective forecasting is our ability to predict the future about how we'll feel about something. There's lots of examples of this, right? People think that winning the lottery will make them so much happier, but in reality, a year later, you go back to how happy you were before. People think that becoming a quadriplegic will make them so depressed. A year later, you go back to how happy or unhappy you were before. And the same thing applies to choice. We all think we want choice. We have we equate choice with freedom. We want to go to Starbucks and have three different sizes and 10 different types of coffee. And we love that board about mixing and matching. Well, you know what the research says? It says that that makes you unhappy. And this is the crux of the paradox of choice. It's the idea that we want choice, but more choices make us depressed. They make us unsure about what decision to make. And they often lead us to either question the decisions we make or experience decision paralysis and make no decision at all. And so how that plays out in dating is that if you are someone who's seeing a lot of people who are interested in you and you are deciding between a thousand dates in your pocket, it becomes very hard to know who should I be with? Who should I invest in? Is the perfect person one swipe away? And then Ellen, the other thing I'll say, because I know you helped me with this recently is uh, Ellen was helping me edit a short essay I was writing about why you should stop talking to your ex. And it's the same idea. We want to have open doors. We want to buy a sweater that we can return. We want to reply maybe to a Facebook event. We want to have a refundable plane ticket. We want the option to change our mind. But the research tells us that having a closed door, having an irreversible decision makes us happier. Because once you commit to something, your brain goes into rationalization mode. It tells you, Ellen, you made the right choice. That is a great sweater. That's the perfect flight. And you start to convince yourself that you made the right choice and then you feel better. But if everything is in the maybe category, you're still weighing the pros and cons and you feel bad. And so the, the, the ending sentence there is basically, you think you want choice and you think you want reversible decisions, but fewer choices and irreversible decisions make you happier. Do you ever, Logan, do you find yourself in your life like actively seeking to limit the number of choices you have? Like, like I don't know, I'm just, I don't know, like seeking out clothing from a place where you can't return it or, or I don't like, are there other ways to do that? Yeah. So I talked earlier about buying the car and trying to buy a car as a satisficer. And so what I did there was saying, what are the things that matter to me? What are the things that don't? I found a car that satisfied those um, expectations and I bought it. There's other tri tricks for maximizers. So one thing that maximizers do is let's say they're searching for a flight. They might spend weeks on end searching for the perfect flight. And so one trick is to say, I'm going to give myself one hour to buy a flight. Or my friend has this and she says, I'm going to give myself five minutes to come up with a coupon code. And if I don't find the coupon code, I'm not going to use one and I'm just going to buy it without the coupon code. And so one thing is just limiting it. I think another thing, um, I, I heard this on a podcast recently. It's just sometimes when you, you are having a hard time choosing, it's because you have two really great options and just taking a minute to recognize like, I'm lucky to have two hard, hard options. And, and, and these are, but both of them is good and, and understanding that there's a lot that can be gained from both of them. But yes, I do spend a lot of time analyzing my own irrational behavior and I do try to limit choices and whether it's um, having a shorter Airbnb wish list or having uh, fewer dates in mind for doing an event, I do really try to limit my choices and then choose among them versus just having this untenable infinite options. Yeah. Um, this is a fun question from Misha. He says, if you were to write a sequel, what would the topic be? Or in other words, what did you want to write about that didn't make this book? I love that. Yeah, I love that question too. I was thinking today, I was like, what would the sequel be? I don't have a funny joke about how to not blank alone, but I, I'll, I'll try to come up with one eventually. Um, yeah, so 
I really put everything that I thought and knew into the book. There's not something where I'm like, I really wanted to include this and I didn't. And I don't know if my publisher, Emily, a close friend of mine is listening, but she and I had a lot of conversations about this. So attachment theory, there's a lot of books on attachment theory. And Emily said, why do you need a chapter on attachment theory? They can go by attached or hold me tight. And I said, this is the single best researched element of relationship science. This has changed my life. This has changed so many people's lives. If I want this to be the Bible, the A to Z guide, it needs to to include attachment theory. And similarly, Emily said, why does it have to include uh, being in a relationship or breakups? Couldn't that be in the next book? And I said, I just want it to take you from being single to should we get married? And so I really did put everything that I know into that book. And I'm sort of, you know, the sophomore album syndrome. I'm starting from scratch. This book <laughs> represented everything I've learned my whole life. And now I'm starting from scratch. But, you know, I got married last year. And I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that's going to come up with marriage and having kids and how do you keep the passion alive? And so I could keep going down the route of dating. I could switch to early marriage and decision making. There's obviously a big opportunity in applying relationship science to business relationships. And so we'll, we'll see what happens with the sequel. But it was such an interesting experience to write a book. And I wonder if my husband will will appreciate me writing another one because He's really the one who suffered the mental health crises that came along the way. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very like lonely and agonizing process. Um, and you don't, you don't, Logan's really good at like working in public, but even then I know it's something you don't always get to share with other people. Um, here's a good question from Craig. Sorry, there's a, sorry. Okay. Yeah. He says, during the pandemic, dating has felt more like an all or nothing decision, whether entering their COVID bubble or because momentum leads people to move in together quickly. I know, Logan, you and I know people who have been through that experience. Um, how should people whose relationship was accelerated by COVID or who have only dated under these abnormal circumstances think about adjusting their expectations when the world goes back to normal and other competing priorities re-enter their lives? Oh, that's a great question. There's so many directions I can take it. One thing I have to say is that my mentor, Eli Finkel, who's a great relationship scientist at Northwestern, his book is called The All or Nothing Marriage. And his whole thesis is that we've started thinking about relationships um, in a different way. And so his whole thing is he applies Maslow's hierarchy of needs to marriage. And he says, we used to marry for sustenance and security. And then over time, we started marrying for love and then belonging. And now we've actually reached the peak of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we marry for self-actualization. And that if your partner doesn't support your dream of being a guitarist in a famous rock band, then you leave the relationship because they didn't help you self-actualize it. His whole point is that we're getting divorced for reasons that we never would have before. And so my, my point is that I think we've actually been in all or nothing relationships for a while because of the expectations that we're putting on them. In terms of COVID, I want to start by saying the silver lining, which is that, Ellen, we might be thinking of the same person, but we both, we have a friend who was notoriously single and he was hopping from one month relationships to two month relationships, choosing the wrong people. They weren't choosing him back. And I think it was because of the intensity of COVID and because of this jolt to the system that made him change his behavior, that he actually did something different. And so he found someone, they started by video dating, then they did a socially distanced date. Then he said, do you want to be part of my pod? And because it took more work and it wasn't like five other people were sitting around waiting for a first date with him, he actually did something different and he invested in that relationship. And now they are moving in together. They just got a puppy. And it's been so beautiful to see how this very bizarre and anxiety provoking situation in the world was the one thing he needed to actually break this bad habit and just invest in someone. And so that's the silver lining is that people have slowed down and they've invested in people. I understand the essence of Craig's question, which is if you've only dated in this one environment, what will it be like after the pandemic is over? And look, I, I think it depends. Some people will continue to thrive. Other people will say, why aren't you spending as much time with me? Other people will say, I realize I was just with you because I was afraid of being alone during the pandemic. I think we're gonna see lots of different types of relationships, but it's probably a good idea to start thinking about that now because a relationship is the dynamic between two people. And so when one of them changes or they both change or the environment changes, it does disrupt the patterns in place and it will be awkward and it will have that moment of growing change, growing pains. And should, I would just say, understand that it's likely going to take some time to adjust and then you'll have to see how do you cope in the new world. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I think this will make this our last question. Um, this is from uh, Mark. He says, 
Do you have thoughts or observations about the effects on early dating conversations of gender gaps within specific geographic locations? Um, I, I think he's probably referring to like, yeah, just like how, like how does this play out depending on whether there are more men or women in a certain city? Yeah, you know, I there are entire books written about this. I think there's a book by John Berger called Datanomics that's all about at universities like Vassar where there's way more women than men, then certain men uh, have different dating experiences than they ever would and are more self-confident. And there's also some interesting research about Ashley Madison, which was, I think it's out of business, the Have an Affair website. And it was basically, um, in areas where the differential between male and female earnings was the highest, people were most likely to have affairs. And so I'm not really an expert on this, but I would say just from a market perspective, yes. Um, if there's more of one gender than the other, um, it does create a power imbalance in which people are pursuing someone else. Why don't, why don't we end with one more question? Sure. Um, there's there's another one from Christina that I think we touched on a little, but uh, I think just because I imagine it's pretty common, I'd love to hear more, which is, what do you think is the key behavior change for a hesitator? She says, speaking for myself, who is also admittedly stubborn, huh? So like, what, like, what would you do if there's someone who really was having trouble changing their mindset about? Yeah. I'm 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 happy to speak to Christina the hesitator and I I'm sure that the pandemic has been a tough time and I feel empathetic towards that. In the book, I have a chapter called Don't Wait Date all about overcoming the hesitator tendency. And so I mentioned this before, but the two issues with the hesitator are one, they underestimate the opportunity cost of getting better at dating. Dating is a skill and you have to get out there and date, right? Stand-up comedy without an audience is just writing. And dating similarly, it requires an audience. The second thing is that you're not learning what type of person you want to be with. And I said, you think you know what you want, but you're wrong. Well, here's how to get right. Go on a bunch of dates and see who you want to be with. What I provide in the book is a checklist. And it's, these are the steps you take to overcome it. And it uses tools from behavior science. So the first one is just setting a deadline. I am going to start dating by this date and you write a date and you sign it. And I recommend three weeks. The second one is to just do the things you need to do in the next three weeks to make that happen. Things like downloading the apps, finding some good photos of you, maybe getting a few outfits for dates. The next thing is, asking a friend to get involved. And so if I were a hesitator, I might say to Ellen, Ellen, I'm serious about finding somebody. 2021 is my year. Will you help hold me accountable to doing these things? Ellen, if she was a good friend, which Logan, she is with black boys. <laughs> the next thing is, and Ellen, I think you like this part of the book. We've talked about it, is the identity of a dater. And so there's this really interesting research out of Harvard that talks about emphasizing people's different identities. And so you might have an identity as a reader, you might have an identity as a sports fan, you might have an identity as someone who loves Beyonce. And I can actually shift your behavior by emphasizing one of those identities. And so the research on this is they wanted more people to vote. So in one experiment, they said, are you planning to vote tomorrow? People said yes or no, and they tracked if they voted. The other one, they said, are you a voter? People said yes or no, are you planning to vote tomorrow? The people who self-identified as voters and then said yes were more likely to go vote because they had just reinforced their identity as a voter. And so how I apply this is I need you to take on the identity as a dater. And so, Christina, you're going to hate me, but you need to stand in front of the mirror and you need to say, I am a dater. I am somebody who's looking for love. I am somebody who's actively dating. I'm not someone who's going to date when the pandemic is over. And the story that Ellen and I have talked about a few times from the book is this guy who called me and he said, Logan, I'm fat. My mom's fat, my dad's fat, I'm very fat. And his story in his head was, I can find love when I lose weight. And what ended up happening was we went shopping, we got him some better fitting clothes, and he ended up meeting up with this girl from college. They went on some walks, he told her about how he was dating, and for the first time, she started seeing him as a dater. It became more romantic. They ended up visiting each other back and forth. And they ended up getting into a relationship because he didn't lose weight. He lost the limiting identity of being someone who needed to lose weight to find love. And so for him, that work of seeing himself as a dater really mattered. And so do the logistical work of downloading the apps, getting the profile, setting a deadline, but also do the inner work of saying, I'm worthy of love now, and I just have to get out there and start dating. I love that. It's 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 like small, but really powerful. It's like, how do you think of yourself as like, 
Because, yeah, imagine if someone comes up to you and they ask you, are you a voter? And you say yes. And then they're like, well, are you going to vote? And you're like, yeah, like, I guess I'm, I guess I'm going to. You want to be consistent. Like yeah. yeah, you want to feel this, like, internal consistency with, like, oh, I'm a, I am who I say I am. Um, so I love that. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, I, if we were in a physical setting, I guess we would, we would get to like stand and hug. Um, but, um, Christina, if you're listening, there you are. Hi. 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 So that was, that was such a great conversation. How interesting. How very interesting. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Ellen. I wrote down so many little things like (laughs) date like a scientist. I think there should be a t-shirt that says date like a scientist. (laughs) And definitely fuck the spark and love is the verb and all of those wonderful things. So I hope that um, everyone listening from everywhere is gonna buy a copy of the book. All you have to do is just like press the green button at the bottom of the screen. We'll ship it right out to you or you can come by the store if you're in Miami, if you're in South Florida, you can pick it up. We have curbside pickup. And I just wanna thank you both for being with us today. Wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. (laughs) <laughs> and hope that you start dating <laughs> yay thanks so much for hosting thank support you. your local bookstore and thanks yeah. ellen thank yeah. you it was, it was so, so much fun, fun to, to find out that you're from south florida that's great yeah yeah logan's a local yeah <laughs> okay bye, bye. Good night.